Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Just an update. We understand that our honored guests are with the VC. I do see the Dean of Students arriving. So if you would continue just to chat amongst yourselves whilst we wait for our guest speakers and the VC and the Dean of Humanities to arrive. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Joanna Boerter, and I'm the Head of Department of Public Law in the Faculty of Law. Thank you, Brenda. And together with uh, Dr. Ongama Mtinka in the Department of Political Science in the Faculty of Humanities, we are the co-program directors for this very special lecture delivered by Professor Barney Pichana, whose work I have read, it's a great honor to meet him, entitled Black Man in a White Man's Court, Readings in Transformative Jurisprudence, which as I said is hosted the lecture uh, in collaboration between the Faculty of Humanities and the Faculty of Law with a response by and I'm going to use both titles, Advocate Professor Tembeka Ngotobi. We have, before uh, we introduce all our special guests today, um, some guests which I must acknowledge as the program starts. Uh, Professors Pichana and Tembeka will be introduced separately by both Onyama and I. But before I hand over to Mr. Lutando Jack, I would like to acknowledge our Vice Chancellor, Professor Sibongile Mutwa. Thank you. It's always wonderful to have her presence at events such as this. To the Executive Dean as well of the Faculty of Humanities, behind me, Professor Pamela Maseko, who will also welcome you shortly. The Executive Dean of the Faculty of Law, my colleague and friend, Dr. Lynn Biggs, and the Dean of Students, Mr. Lutando Jack, also seated on the stage today. So my job to get things going is to welcome, first of all, Mr. Lutando Jack and to introduce you to him. He, as I've said, is the Dean of Students, and he has over 20 years of experience in senior leadership and management of public institutions. He has a B.Tech in public management and a Bachelor of Philosophy. That's impressive. I heard today that he's also a former president of Boxing South Africa, which just goes to show you that brawn and brains can be combined to great effect. So you best all behave today. He's got the words and he's got the fists. And on that note, I'm going to be seated and hand over to Lutando to welcome all the special guests today. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Boetha, for, for that uh, surprise uh, uh, introduction, uh, especially the boxing part of it. Um, program directors, um, uh, Professor Porter and uh, Dr. Mdinka, Mdinka. Uh, our Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Sbongile Mutua, um, Depu Deputy Vice Chancellors uh, present, uh, our guest speakers uh, uh, of the day, uh, Professor Bani. Uh, uh, Nyameko, uh, you know, um, uh, Kunzima, you know, to, to, call, to call that name, you know, uh, if, you are a, uh, if you are a black African, uh, you know, uh, you struggle to call uh, an elderly person by uh, his or her first name. Uh, Professor Pijana and um, uh, Professor Tembeka, Mbaitobi, uh, Bondomse. Executive Deans uh, of the Faculties of uh, Humanities uh, and Law, uh, Professor Maseko and uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Biggs. Management and staff of the uh, uh, two faculties that are hosting us uh, this, uh, this evening. Professor uh, and, uh, Andre Odendal, uh, honorary professor in the history uh, uh, and heritage studies uh, 
um, at the University of the Western Cape. Uh, Professor Tipa, uh, our former uh, Dean of the Faculty of Arts uh, at the then University of Port Elizabeth and at the then uh, Nelson Mandela Metropolitan uh, University. University student leadership and uh, uh, the students, particularly from the two faculties uh, who are hosting us, and uh, leadership uh, uh, both from the uh, student chapter of the Black Lawyers Association and the Law Students uh, Society. Guests from all over uh, the world who are watching us on our YouTube channel, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. Let, let me first of all congratulate uh, the two faculties uh, of humanities and law for jointly hosting uh, at, at this lecture. Collaborating, uh, in my view, uh, particularly in a, an increasingly more complex world, is not a matter of luxury, but an imperative uh, for, for sustainability. So, so thank you so much, uh, the two deans and the rest of the uh, faculty, staff, and students for uh, leading us you know, on, this, uh, on this front. We would also wish to upfront uh, thank uh, both Professor Pichana and, uh, and Guy Toby uh, for accepting our invitation uh, to deliver this lecture as well as uh, to be uh, um, a, a respondent. We truly appreciate your being with us uh, this, um, uh, 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 this afternoon. We, we know that uh, you've been given national assignments, uh, Prof. Pijana, uh, the task of uh, rebuilding the National Lotteries Commission is, uh, is an arduous but uh, a, necessary, a, a necessary task, and we wish you all the best um, uh, in performing that national, uh, 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 national assignment. And of course, we know that uh, Ndawetu, uh, apart from your work uh, in the legal fraternity, you've got also many assignments that you are performing on behalf of, uh, behalf of the nation. This, uh, this lecture takes place 61 years uh, after our Nelson Mandela, um, defiantly and yet eloquently uh, told the magistrate uh, on the dock in 1965 that he was not and uh, would not get uh, a fair and proper trial uh, at a black man, uh, I mean as a black man in a white man's um, a court. Equally, it takes place 30 years after the, the adoption of the interim constitution, I'm sure we all remember that we had an interim constitution before the 1996 constitution. It also takes place 27 years later uh, after the uh, adoption of the, current, uh, of the current constitution and almost 30 years after the 1994 democratic uh, uh, breakthrough. So therefore, given these intertwined milestones, coincidentally, where our namesake, uh, Nelson Mandela, had a significant role uh, in bringing these to bear, this lecture is truly an idea whose time has come, if I were to paraphrase uh, Victor Hugo. So if all these milestones that I mentioned above were amongst others meant to create foundations for a socially just society and shifts on the judicial front towards transformative um, a, a jurisprudence, then how far have we come? So what are, what are the readings in transformative uh, um, uh, jurisprudence. Of course, fortunately, that's for me to answer the, the question. This was our capable uh, lecture that this uh, this afternoon to, to well as uh, examine uh, uh, this question. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, my my was just a simple task of uh, welcoming.
can't see it, you will soon feel it in your heart, uh, in your mind, when uh, the neurons uh, in your brain are, are firing, and it's going to be an exciting uh, journey. Mine now is to introduce the head of our faculty, uh, who's very passionate about these projects, and many others as part of our humble contribution as a faculty to the strategy of the university. And it's none other than Professor Antonella Maseko. She plays a number of roles in the country, leading roles and internationally. And I have the honor uh, this morning of calling her to the platform. Uh, let's give a round of applause. Speakers for the day, uh, Prof. Van uh, Pikiana, who is an honorary professor in the university, and of course, Professor um, Advocate um, Tembeka Ngaito, uh, who is an adjunct professor in the Faculty of Law, um, the, my colleague, Executive Dean of Law, um, who will be co hosting uh, this event, management from both faculties. Um, um, Professor Andre Ordendal, who is our guest um, in the faculty. Uh, Professor is Professor Ordendal is a friend uh, of the faculty and the university. Um, I was told that Professor Henry Tifa uh, is also here, the former uh, Dean of Arts. Um, uh, I think this was a pre uh, faculty before humanities faculty. Um, university student leadership uh, led by um, the SRC and all students are uh, present. Um, the Nelson Mandela University student chapters of the Black Lives Association and the Law Students uh, Society. Um, friends, guests who are watching online um, from all over the world, um, members of the media uh, who are here, Diabolisa, Dalej Kanan. Um, this year marks the 200th year since its course was converted from an oral to a systematically written language in 1823. This occurred along the banks of the Kume River, about 10 kilometers um, from the present day Alice. This site later became the Kume Mission Station and the birthplace of the printing in this part of the world. Um, obviously, um, it was, uh, the printing press was later destroyed um, in about 1844 during, I think it was the sixth uh, French war. I've got <laughs> an Islamic historian here, so I've got to be careful with my dates. Um, the, the printing press was an integral part um, to the introduction of Christian schooling and in the entrenchment of the British colonial, colonial administration. It enabled the production of school textbooks, literature, scholarly works, and other in information in conventional book form and in newspapers. While it was initially controlled and driven by missionaries at, by missionaries at its introduction, specifically for the purpose of executing the British colonial administration project. The early black thinkers who were themselves products of missionary schooling took over the press from the 1880s and used it in producing a variety of texts from a black perspective. Texts produced covered a variety of subjects, including politics and history as reflected in Prof. Ordendahl's Avogani Bantu and, and the founders, one of those key texts um, that are important for humanities and law students. And Kopa's works collected in a volume titled Imbali Zamandulo. There were also legal texts, for example, Mkai's Ikyalala Mawele, as well as scientific uh, texts such as Godfrey's collection of works submitted by natives in Blightswood Review. On ornithology, um, which I learned later was a bad science, 
zoology, botany, and all other forms of science submitted by the natives um, at the time. There were also philosophical texts um, such as those um, reflected in Solilo's Umoya Wembongi. As a scholar today, you would be fooled and think that these texts were works of literature in that the history, politics, philosophy, law, and other disciplines um, were embedded in literary forms such as drama, poetry, prose, etc. And these reflected, as indicated earlier, the historical experience of the native population. These texts were also written largely in the vernacular, in a sequoza, um, this to escape the consequence one would bear if found in their writings to portray an experience that vilified British colonial rule and was complementary to black culture and experience and other ways of doing things. This literary archive is so important in the academic project, especially in Mandela, as we seek to imagine um, the future um, of Africa or our future. It is aligned to the research theme of the institution on origin, culture, heritage, and memory. And we've taken this as a faculty, as a, as a, fac as a faculty strategy, as one of the tools we have to use in the, revital in the revitalization of the humanities, which is also one of the faculty research themes. As a faculty, our focus is on identifying, documenting, curating, and archiving cultural heritage as are captured in these texts um, in an effort to reimagine the African past and the future, and as part of the decolonization and Africanization project. Because these two paragraphs, I'm going to read them in Kosa. Abantundu bateke kabe kalisa ukpalangu kwabo, ba veza i ngwati ezi velisa i ngeko ya bantu bumkup. I ngeko ke ebi sanyeliswa, u i ngwati, aku ngwati ilwe sikolo ebe lu veliswa e kalini. Umkai umzeke lo ta apala i ngwati eti jala la mawele, u teta injongo yake ukupale ni le ngwati. Uti, Kukubonisa imikutu ama kosa ebe itata ukulandela umteto no bulungisa. Acho ati ka ekebezela. Zite ndiakota, zite za kufika intlanga ezi mshope za kuntu laka no bomi kuindela ekwenzangayo izi ndo kweli. Ukutuntu la ke akuyo ngaki. Ingaki kukuti ngoku ukutuntu le kodwa uyikhanyele intsusa yale nto uyicondzuleyo I'm not intending to summarize this let, let me not try and summarize it uh, but it is, perhaps it's just to to to, to capture um ikyala la mawele one of the key texts um in his kosa written in his kosa by one of the kosa laureates uh, uh Samuel Onemkai um, when he talks about um, how the Kosa, um, at the time, this book is, writing in, is written in 1914, the processes and the systematic way in which um, Ahmad Kosa um, executed legal um, and judicial processes. That's, that's as far as I can go <laughs> in this Kosa. Okay. Today, um, we have um, Professor Bikiani, Bikiana and Professor Advocate Nogai Tobi. Um, and the most important thing that um, I think we need, we communicated to them when we were talking about this lecture, was the importance of history um, in unearthing um, some aspects of the discip of disciplines in higher education, and in this case, law. What is important for us as university, um, as universities, is that we have to unearth this. We have to unearth the history, um, especially that history which has been um, 
invisibilized, um, erased, um, and deliberately um, so for us to understand these disciplines because disciplines emerge from a historical context. It is our role um, as, as I think as a faculty of humanities, we have um, put that as our strategic goal um, in the faculty to take the responsibility um, of an archiving, so unearthing um, this archive, these historical texts um, for the benefit um, of the enrich and the enrichment of our academic project. Such work cannot be done from one discipline, from a singular discipline or from one faculty. And this initiative um, is the beginning of many cross-faculty and transdisciplinary collaboration. Um, a, as indicated earlier, the event today marks the first in a series of um, events to mark the 200 years of um, Return is closer. The climax um, of uh, this year will be in September to coincide with the Heritage Month as well um, as a faculty a reflection on the academic uh, project of the institution and which have taken on as our academic project um, of the faculty. And this is the revitalization of the um, humanities, especially that it is five years since 2018 when this was pronounced uh, by the Vice Chancellor as one of the strategic focus areas. So Ngalomazwi, Nam Ekameni Le Faculty I thank you, Diti Makwande. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof Maseko. I could hear a penny drop as uh, Prof was presenting. I think what I could take away from uh, her submission is that we are humbly attempting to make our own contribution as a faculty. And the humility of it is in recognizing that we are not the first. There have been those that have come before us. They have contributed something of great worth. And I like, Prof, that you are also reflecting on how writings which may not have been regarded at the time, because maybe it was not in a book or something, uh, may not have been regarded as great contributions in a beyond the literature, the point that you're making. We are now doing the redemptive work to actually acknowledge them for what they are. I was really touched by that. Um, there's a saying in this class that inyat ibuzo kwa or if it's a, it's a saying that originates from hunting communities. It says, if you want to, don't go in Yati, buffalo. Buffalo, if in buffalo has got a different meaning in our time, uh, we have a president, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna go there. <laughs> the, saying, the saying is that if you really want to get the best prize from a hunt, ask those that have gone ahead of you. And I think that we are ready for that. Prof, as a typical businessman, academic, among some of the major things that he is, has, uh, would have loved to make a presentation, but uh, I'm sure he will share it somehow. Uh, I have the honor this evening of introducing uh, Professor Pani Pichana. Uh, Prof Pichana is a struggle stalwart and a recipient of the Order of Boabab for his excellent contribution to a just and democratic South Africa, and for the spiritual upliftment of the oppressed. Professor Pichena is the acting chair of the Desmond Tutu Intellectual Property Trust. He is a retired principal and vice chancellor of the University of South Africa and professor emeritus of law at UNISA. He is also visiting honorary professor in the Department of Philosophy at Rhodes University. Professor Pichana has qualifications in law and in theology, is an attorney of the High Court of South Africa, and is a provincial canon in the Anglican Church of Southern Africa. His research interests are in human rights, ethics, and theology. He is a member of the Academy of Science of South Africa and serves as its vice president. In July 2022, Prof. Pichana was appointed as the chairperson of the National Lotteries Commission.
The NLC serves as South Africa's only lotteries and sports pool betting regulator, but also serves as a grant funder for non-government organizations established for causes aimed at improving the lives of South Africans, especially the marginalized. Let us welcome Professor Bani Pichan. I'm very, I'm very impressed. Uh, Dr. Amtimka is very up to date. <laughs> Uh, about what is happening in my life. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, and I'm very, I'm very uh, honored to be here, and very honored that the Vice Chancellor is uh, is is in the audience uh, uh, today for this lecture. A very honored to have many of the friends. Um, uh, here, I'm very grateful to the um, to the dean of the Faculty of Human Sciences and the dean of law uh, for the invitation. Um, I just wanted to, as a way of honoring this event, I wanted to dedicate this to somebody who's been very special to me, uh, Judge. Dumile Kondile, DSS Kondile, passed away about two weeks ago. And he was, uh, he'd been retired since 2012. Uh, he's been judge in the Peter Marisberg uh, High Court. Uh, his importance is that he was my mentor and I did articles with him um, many years ago. But he's been very close to much of what I do and uh, contributed a great deal, uh, and particularly uh, contributed to shaping um, uh, what could have been a lawyer in me, which was never to be, it's not his fault. <laughs> um, so, so, and also, uh, Judge Cornille is the son uh, of this city. Um, so I rather um, feel uh, obliged to acknowledge him today. The second thing I want to do is just to give you a, a kind of this topic. How do I get to this topic? Some years ago, I was um, asked to examine a, an LLD thesis um, by a student which was a thesis in, ju in jurisprudence, and, 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 and got me very, very interested, this thesis did, um, in how do we actually get to uh, understand how law works in society, and indeed to whose benefit law actually function. And um, I, I said in my comments to the uh, thesis that this is just such an important uh, subject that I wish though that what I was missing was somebody who would really take uh, from African literature, um, from the politics of this country, I mentioned Kyalala Mawele, and understand how in those societies uh, actually um, law functioned. And secondly, I said to, I didn't supervise a student, by the way, he was supervised with someone else, and I said, you know, what, I, what really would have brought the thesis alive if he had really dealt with uh, Nelson Mandela's first speech from the dock uh, in 1962. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I didn't know, I didn't, I, I don't think the student uh, actually knew anything about that. Um, but in fact, it was a thesis that was drawn a great deal from the American uh, uh, system, and I thought that was a bit unfortunate. But that did actually indicate to me that there was work to be done in this field, and to the best of my knowledge, uh, I haven't seen anything like it. So I rather jumped at the opportunity to 
to come here and do what you're going to see very quickly is an exploratory, a broad brush strokes um, uh, uh, attempt at trying to deal with this, not as a student um, who's, who's going to produce an LLD, um, uh, not even for publication purposes, not now, but I wish something like this would be published uh, uh, out of what I'm saying. So the topic actually conjures in me something about the sources of ideas about law and its implications for human life. So I, I, I have, a, a, like all South Africans, a sense of awareness of the state of law in our country, and indeed of lawyering and the, and the quality of lawyering and the lawyers. As, a, as an attorney, obviously, I, I'm, I'm very critical of uh, conduct by lawyers and attorneys and, uh, and the attitudes of societies about lawyers and attorneys. And indeed, from where I was uh, qualified in the 1970s, and look at younger lawyers today, and I, and I realize that this is a very different world. And I'm also aware that uh, in our society today, South Africans are rather ambivalent about law and the nature of law. There are public doubts, and uh, there's also a, a kind of popular appeal to law as a practice and, uh, and in public life. But at the same time, I think, uh, uh, Advocate Mugai Tobi uh, might take me up on this. I think that South Africans actually find it very difficult to associate themselves with much of the law that is going on. At the same time, we've become a society that was very law-bound. Uh, everything, we are very litigious. Uh, we, we take everything for judges to try and resolve all our issues. Let me just give you a, a road map to this lecture as I have it. I've just done some introduction for you to situate what I want to say, and I, I'll, I'll deal very briefly with some definitions. I'll talk about the constitutional dispensation that we're in at the moment, and I'll then move on quickly to dealing with what I regard as indigenous law. I'll use Ikela Lamawele as a way of understanding indigenous law as a body of law and traditions observed by a group of people, or as a traditional system of justice for the resolution of disputes. I will almost immediately, as a, as a, a, a counter pose with Nelson Mandela's speech in court in a black man in a white man's court, and this, this feeling of alienation that Nelson Mandela mentions so eloquently in that speech. And then I come to deal with the constitutional dispensation that we have today, the aspirations and expectations that South Africans have today for law. And I give a critique which I draw largely from um, uh, jurisprudence scholars Vessel Leroux and Karin van Mal. And then in, 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 in the end, I'll come to deal with Achi, Professor Achi Mafeja's book of essays in search of an alternative uh, on revolutionary theory and politics. Now for starters, the obvious things we all know, the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, 1996. It says very, very clearly, right at the beginning, section one of the Constitution, the, South Af the Republic of South Africa is one sovereign democratic state founded on the following values. And C of that is supremacy of the Constitution and the rule of law. Really, that's where the idea of a constitutional state comes from. The fact that the supremacy of the Constitution and the rule of law and in terms of which the Constitution is a supreme law of the Republic, L-A-W, before I use law as L-O-R-E. I'm now using law as L-A-W. Law or conduct inconsistent with it is invalid and the obligations imposed upon it must be fulfilled. 
And really for many of us, especially like me, who had studied law in the previous dispensation, this was revolutionary. Uh, it promised a radical departure from the then prevailing apartheid, and indeed even an Anglo-Saxon concepts of lawmaking. And we really were looking for a new idea that was emerging. Uh, and frankly, not many of us knew any differently because we were trained in a system of law which was far removed from anything like this. And yet, we knew that the Roman Dutch law and the English law systems that were entrenched and formed the foundations of all South African law were repressive, were oppressive, were undermining the human capacity for excellence and for being more human. And then there was, we knew all along, that there was the common law in the country, which was not so common after all, because it was a law common to a certain section of the population, by and large, common to the same Anglo-Saxon and Roman Dutch communities. We felt that we needed a new possibility for the common law to reflect all sources of law in society around which society organizes itself. So we had an opportunity that common law can mean something different than what we have seen before. We thought this ought to include customary law because it never did. And that customary law was recognized and is recognized as a subset of the law of the land. Now having done that, let's just look a little bit more closely at what we mean by some of the uh, 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 phrases that I use. Jurisprudence, by that I refer to the theoretical analysis of legal issues at the highest level of abstraction. That's what the Oxford Dictionary of Law tells me. But I think if I may put it simply in my own words, that jurisprudence refers to the sources and influences, applications, understandings, and influences of law in society in its theoretical meanings. In other words, you, you try to unearth the very depth of the foundations of law and indeed what, you see, what it seeks to achieve. Indigenous refers to that which is original or native to a society or what was in existence and that shaped the thinking and practice of people and communities from earliest times, or simply that which can be traced to times preceding the colonization or the introduction of dominant culture by settler colonial powers. Of course, as always, the difficulty with these phrases is that they've become rather stuck in a, with particular meanings. Uh, when you say indigenous, you kind of uh, conjure up people who are half-dressed and are dancing uh, around and they are singing in a particular way and they are painting themselves and they are doing all the things that we don't do or some of us at least uh, are embarrassed about. That which is actually a, a sense of depth of who we are that we do not want easily to acknowledge. But in fact uh, indigenous then tells us about that which had been suppressed, but it which forms the identity that shapes the conduct and the regulation of society, and that which the people continue to bear allegiance to and to honor. So, so that is in fact our idea of what is indigenous. That's, that's, the, that's the use to which I put it in this, in this address. Iris Medoc, Iris Medoc, the novelist, um, in, a, in, a, in a wonderful interview in a, in a book by uh, Brian McGee in Oxford in 1978, uh, McGee um, uh, uh, assembled interviews with about 20, I think, uh, of the contemporary philosophers of the time from Europe and across the Atlantic. And among, and it says the, the title of the book is Men of Ideas, but Iris Medoc is far from being a man, but for the purposes of the book, she was a man. Beauty in art, says Medoc, 
is the formal imaginative exhibition of something that is true. An exhibition of something that is true is an art form. So law can be an art form that kind of begins to talk to us about the kind of people we are, the kind of issues that we wrestle about, we fight about, that often we bring for resolution to a third party uh, or somebody else. And I want to suggest that this is part, exactly what S.A.K. Mpaye was dealing with in, in Ikala Lama Well. I'll take a little bit of time on that. And, and in Ikala Lama Well, which is thought to have influenced the appreciation and observance of closer traditions and customs. Something that was actually very, very important to S.A.K. Mpaye because even he spent his tender years at his uncle's place, Kutlandane, that's when he really began to have an appreciation of closer storytelling of law and resolution of disputes, of Inzomi and history of the people, and which he has sought to reflect and represent in his performative uh, oral po poetry that he did. And Ikela Lama Wele for me is, a, is for me at least, a wonderful starting point. And I, I recall many of you will probably join me in reciting aspects of this because uh, when, when we were at school as, um, in the earlier years of our study, we could always recite uh, uh, as a came client, Dimangel Ambisa Dimangel Dimangale Lubabini Ambisa Ubabini Undi Komile. I can imagine the complainant walking towards the, uh, the palace of the king, Gongkul, and along the road reciting the purpose of his visit to there. And the registrar, uh, they call it here, they call it here um, Umbali, uh, the registrar of the king's court gathers the wise men um, around uh, for the hearing of this Ismangalo Subekwai. Now, in this case, it was a very interesting uh, episode because uh, it, was, it was just amazing the way it was dealt with. Number one, it was participatory. It looks like everybody in the village is free to come. And the way it is written, it also does begin to sound like entertainment. People were there. They were entertained by this story that was being told. And you could hear it uh, from the elders who were interrogating uh, this young man. Uh, and the second thing about it, it was, it was, it was very truthful. Nobody denied, she did, he didn't deny that Babini was my twin and Babini was my elder twin. It took them a long time to understand, then why are you here then? If, if you acknowledge him to be your elder twin, he was there because he felt he was pushed out of the responsibility of, of the firstborn in the family to preside over the customary activities of the family by his brother. And then, of course, they couldn't understand. They interrogated uh, very, very slowly, very, very carefully, over days, I think. The third thing that uh, struck me, uh, which is uh, uh, really something like the same, is that they had a system of precedence. Because in the middle of this, somebody said, has anything like this ever happened in this community? So they had to go and fetch an elder from somewhere uh, who could tell that during the year so and so, uh, a thing like this ever happened. They were very keen because in the eyes of that generations of elders, this was unique. They had never heard of a contestation among twins who do not deny that they were twins. But still, the younger of the twins, who also doesn't deny that he was younger, uh, claims the right. 
And then, and then what happened? There's a whole series of interventions by different people who are asking, arguing among themselves, conversing among themselves about this matter that is so hard and difficult. In the end, they brought in the midwives who were there at that time. And they said to the midwives, tell us what happened. And so they said, yes, uh, we were attending to uh, Vuisile's wife and, 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 and the first child came uh, uh, with the hand and we cut uh, in it uh, and then the child disappeared. And then, and then uh, a second child came, we thought was the same. Only when the child was delivered did we discover that this is not the child who was cut the nighty. <laughs> so now, the conundrum now is, who is the older of these? Because traditionally, the child who appeared first would be the eldest. But now the elder child is being claimed by two people and they had been discussing this. And it turns out that there had been a whole history among them and other boys in the community about this. And then, in Zanzol, in the end, the king summarizes and gives a ruling in a manner that is different from a judgment uh, that we know it. I want to read that uh, the way he does it. He says to Wella, who is the complainant, Pula Pula Kemfoka Vuisile, Seku Masuku Ingo Sizam Ezizem Kaye Makaina, Azokuba Weza Kuti, Nom Trimbi on Abileo. Very important that the taking of ownership of the issue that is no longer just the twins who are fighting among themselves, the goodwill and whatever comes out of it is owned by the nation. So, from the lower court to the next level of the court. Lengundla no ko sei vela ko ngaba. Ai tabela ngakwel. Ati awo ko enu ayile ayile ngundla ko duka uye ko kangela kwa elo tole buka te uli kangela. Udine olo sapo luka vuisile. Amazing thing, he says, you know, continue to do the good thing you do. Look after your family. Um, ensure that the customs and the traditions of your people are upheld. We give you that responsibility. And then he says to the, uh, to the putative elder twin, you go back and support your brother in building your father's home. Now, that way of resolution of a dispute isn't the usual way that disputes are done and handled. Because usually, it's about who is right and who's wrong, right? It's about who's, oh no, what's happening? <laughs> Let's start again. Um, so that's how, that's how it was dealt with. So the statement of dispute by Wele was a public one, was recited orally, and participants came and participated. There was the Audi Alteram Partem rule, a principle of natural justice that was applied. There was stare the cases to abide by previous decisions on the same cause, the doctrine of precedence, 
and there were witnesses and expert witnesses. There was every reason to believe that the presider, who is the chief, had listened and heard. And at the end of the day, bore in mind the needs of the family and the needs of the nation. So the resolution was not just an individual pleasure to please an individual. At the end of the day, it was about what is it that society expects of the matter that was brought to them. Today, the Constitution says, everyone has a right to have any dispute that can be resolved by the application of law, decided in a fair public hearing before a court or where appropriate another independent and impartial tribunal or forum. So Hinza's uh, court, the way it handled the evidence was essentially inquisitorial. It was really receiving the evidence and interrogating the evidence. Evidence was collected from a wide range of sources. There was examination of that evidence, which was a shared responsibility of the people who know something about the, the cultures and the customs of the community, but the judgment is reserved only for the presider, who is the chief. And the final outcome is conciliation. And the prerogative to uphold the peace and the restoration of broken relationships. The contrast then with Nelson Mandela's uh, a black man in a, in a white man's court was an interrogation. In fact, Mandela uses the international common standards of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 1948 as his jump off point and really tries to show how South Africa in the way in which it handles is actually uh, uh, in a way that is totally at variance with what civilized nations would do. And he says, uh, Mandela says, how, how do, you, do I feel when I am in a court, there's a white person who is a policeman who arrests me, there's a white orderly who pr brings me from, and I, the prosecutor is white, the judge is white, in what way am I expected to believe that there is justice and fairness in that? So in a sense, what Mandela was focusing on is the alienation that he was bound to feel. And with alienation, so also he was alienated from any possibility of a just outcome, which the sons, the twins of Wiesel would not have felt because the people around the table, the people were there, well, there were no tables, <laughs> uh, were, were traditional people who understood the community where, where, where they came from. And, and Mandela was saying that, I am just completely alienated from everything that happens here. And therefore, I cannot expect a just outcome. And I think, you know, that is just such an important uh, 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 approach, and I'm, I'm going through this very, very quickly, if you don't mind. And something that is also um, expressed by Chinua Achebe in his uh, autobiography, a rather slim autobiography, uh, Home and Exile, published in 2000. And he says that, you know, um, the Igbo people have always lived in a world of continual struggle, in emotion and change. Life was changing all the time. They were, they were engaged in, 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 in a struggle for the best that they can afford, the best that society had uh, uh, expected them. But then, the, then comes all the foreign aspects which are elevated to a level of value that we never really could ever have imagined as the Igbo people. For us, the word was not about Igbo things. So, so justice to Mandela was not about the African things or the closet things, was not about upholding um, community or the value of people. It was exactly the opposite. He says it's not about Igbo things because 
This was about faraway places and peoples and that its acquisition was painful. But equal things did not vanish from our lives. They were embedded in us. They were present, but taken for granted. And they were unacknowledged, but they were real. So this idea of law, dealing and, and being able to mine the depth of what is real to people and understanding very, very clearly what this actually meant for them. Okay, let me just go to the next. How much time have I got? Sure, okay. So and then I go on to a section that talks about law per se, a law as illustrative of one's and of society's wrestling with the human condition and their existential circumstances. Law is a sociological event a moment in time when human conduct and the resolution of and aspirations to the good life are at play. It's a statement about the moral condition of society. Now, the late Chief Justice Pius Langer wrote a paper on transformative constitutionalism. And he drew from the, from the epilogue to the interim constitution of that time. And the thing that he says that, in fact, transformation was, was essentially about the application of the Constitution. And, and I'm saying that that was not enough because actually, and I'm going to finish off with this, um, that was not enough because what is in that Constitution is not self-effecting. You know, it, it doesn't give a life to itself. It depends on so much else to make it uh, uh, truthful and meaningful. But, if, but essentially, it must avoid a parallelism. And this is a point that Achima Feger makes in that book of essays called In Search of an Alternative. For him, things that are indigenous and African are not an invitation of what he calls to an Africanist obsession or a fetish about race or seeking to prioritize race or tribe, whatever you call it. Mafeja actually calls this a counter-revolutionary trap in a petty bourgeois nationalism. But actually, it should be liberating. If it is uh, African, it must be liberating instead of being combative without being revolutionary. His plea is that we should be integrating and paying attention to the structural norms of our society. What is liberating and revolutionary is freedom to act, freedom to revolt, freedom to call into question, freedom to probe deeper through what may appear to be so, but in fact it is not. Freedom to be self-reliant in practice, in actual practice. And then he says, and I, 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 I translate him to be saying, African indig indigenous jurisprudence is not a trumpet call to a past, but to a future and the present that lays the foundation for a viable present in a constitutional environment. Is that your five minutes? Done, thank you. Thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, Pichana, for a fascinating address. I hope that uh, some of our students will take up the challenge that you posed at the beginning of your lecture, namely the need to interrogate the idea of law 
and law's role in South African society today, not from a Western perspective, but with reference to African indigenous jurisprudence. Perhaps we could persuade you to supervise or co-supervise a thesis that addresses law's functioning in our context and takes into account the true meaning of transformative social justice and thus a truly cross-disciplinary project. But it is not my role to respond to your excellent lecture. That honor is reserved for Professor and Advocate Tembeka Mukotobi, SC, an adjunct prof in the Department of Criminal and Procedural Law at Nelson Mandela University, an advocate of the High Court of South Africa, senior counsel, a member of the Judicial Services Commission, a part-time member of the Competition Tribunal, and an acting judge of the High Court, the Labor Court, and the Land Claims Court. Now, Professor Tembeka holds a BPROC and LLB from the then University of Transkei, now Walter Sisulu University, and two LLM degrees, one from Rhodes, and the other from the London School of Economics and Political Science. I venture to suggest that there's a university missing there, <laughs> Prof. <laughs> In his early career, Mkatoibi served as a law clerk to the former Chief Justice Arthur Chaskelson. He also worked at the Legal Resources Center and became director of its constitutional litigation unit. He has appeared as a counsel in a number of very prominent cases, including the famous EFF versus speakers of the National, Speaker of the National Assembly case, where the Constitutional Court held that the failure by the National Assembly to make rules regulating the removal of a president and to determine whether the president had breached the Constitution was a violation of the Constitution and thus invalid. Prof. Tembeka convinced the court that the National Assembly should be ordered to comply with the Constitution, to make the necessary rules, and to fulfill its constitutional obligations without delay. This case resulted in a fundamental change to South Africa's political landscape. Lukatoyi's 2021 judgment overturning the rape conviction of Loiso Koko dealt with the contentious question of whether a rape accused is permitted to raise the defense that she or he genuinely but mistakenly believed that the alleged victim had consented to sex. Whilst it was not Nukotogi's conclusion that consent to foreplay or oral sex constitutes consent to penetrative sex, the judgment prompted much debate and may even be addressed during the panel discussion later today. As an author, Professor Nukotogi has written two books. The first is entitled The Land is Ours, South Africa's First Black Lawyers and the Birth of Constitutionalism, and the second, more recent book is called Land Matters, South Africa's Failed Land Reform and the Road Ahead. This was shortlisted for the Sunday Times Book Prize of 2022, with the publisher's blurb telling us that thoughtful and provocative Land Matters sheds light on one of the most complex questions in South Africa today. Nelson Mandela University is delighted to host Professor Ngotoigi this afternoon he is a lawyer, public speaker, author, activist, and scholar who is never afraid to speak his mind and with whom we are honored to be associated. His work embodies the Mandela research theme of social justice and democracy. I give you Professor Tembeka to respond. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm told that the Itasha Yinja. I'm sorry for the non closer speakers, but uh, time is against us, that's what it means. And I want to thank the, the university uh, also for the generous introduction I've just uh, received. And no matter to Ucho Lingom, Lugamambo, Miss Akawunda Yong, Akona said bye. 
and and also uh, thank Professor Pichana for an insightful and provocative lecture. Um, he did not share his paper in advance, uh, which meant that I had to scribble the notes as he was talking. But uh, he was excellent as usual. What I thought I should do usefully is to identify themes um, that would constitute a philosophical frame, legal philosophy this time, uh, as opposed to what I was talking about in the morning. A legal philosophical frame, uh, maybe to explore and debate some of the themes that he, he raises. But I thought I should start with a quote from Martin Chanok, um, who is the writer of the text um, uh, on South African legal history. Um, which says, for it is the transformation of custom into customary law, into something that state courts will recognize and force and require that disrupts the continuity of the indigenous systems. And so from this quote, indigenous systems pre-exist custom and they pre-exist customary law, but they are disrupted by custom and disrupted by customary law. And I will explain what he means by that, but what he does is to separate an indigenous system um, of administration and governance from customary law. And so from the onset, we have to distinguish between uh, an indigenous system and customary law. From the Case, well, three attributes seem to be identifiable that distinguish um, the indigenous method of dispute resolution from the Western method. The one is what is the object? What is the purpose of dispute resolution? Is it to decide who is right, who is wrong? Or is it to decide how to do justice between two people that see the problem differently. It seems, Professor Pijan, that you are suggesting that the object of an indigenous method of conflict resolution is not to decide who is right from who is wrong, but it is to answer the antecedent question, how to do justice between people that are in disagreement about how to resolve a problem. The second question is who participates? Is it the judge and the lawyers and the witnesses? Or is it a collective endeavor, a collective effort? And that also seems to be a unique distinguishing feature between the method that is employed. Western Eurocentric or European methods prioritize the judges, the lawyers, and Ordinary people come in either as witnesses or as observers, but never as participants. By contrast, the distinction between witness, judge, lawyer is blurred in a customary system. The final question is who decides? Although a judge decides in a Western European system, in a customary system, a chief, maybe a headman, or maybe a king would make the final determination. But it is not his decision. He is merely reflecting the collective will. Those are methodological distinctions. Those are questions of process, not of substance. But I think, Professor Pitana, you are also suggesting that the method is important in respect of legitimacy of the outcome. An outcome is more likely to be considered legitimate because of its object, of who participates, and of who decides. By contrast, a, me a mechanism that is exclusionary, a mechanism which is intended to decide right from wrong as opposed to the me mechanism of doing justice, a mechanism that imposes an unelected, unknown, um, 
external party to impose a decision is likely or prone to less legitimacy and therefore less acceptability of its outcomes. So far so good then about what are the philosophical questions that arise in relation to the process, the method of arriving at disputes, which is illustrated by the case Ichala Lamawel and illustrated by Nelson Mandela's protestation, because Mandela is not protesting at the content of the law. He is protesting at the appearance, at the system that is exclusionary in its nature. What about the content then? How do we grapple with the problem of the content, the question of the substance of the law? The problem here is that for most of us who are subjects of colonialism, there is a connection between the moment of the formation of the state and the moment of the imposition of customary law. And customary law is a method to disturb indigenous ways of life. And the reason why we can say that is because customary law is what was embodied in official codes, official rules, and official institutions. And what was embodied in official rules, codes, and institutions was usually distinct from the true indigenous mode of life. And it tended to coincide with a vision, or perhaps the version, of the colonists. And this is what the Constitution intended to resolve, is how do you create a legitimate system from a process point of view and a legitimate system from a content point of view. In other words, the content being a true reflection of indigenous ways of life. Not old, but present indigenous ways of life. At least on that point, we seem to completely align with Professor Pichan. Customary law as a concept appears at least three times in the Constitution. The first is in section 211, subsection 1, which says the institution, status, and role of traditional leadership, according to customary law, are recognized subject to the Constitution. The second is in section 211, subsection 3, the courts must apply customary law when that law is applicable subject to the Constitution and any legislation that specifically deals with customary law. And the third is under Section 39.2, when interpreting any legislation and when developing the common law or customary law, every court, tribunal, or forum must promote the spirit, purport, and objects of the Bill of Rights. Quite clearly, customary law is part and parcel of the Constitution, but as what? The Constitution does not define what customary law is. It treats it as if it is a given in the same way as the common law is, or in the same way as statutory law is. And yet we know from history that the content of customary law is a much disputed subject. So how do we use the method to identify the content? Or how do we identify the content? Now, the content is not easy. We always go back to the method of identifying the content. Chanok again explains one source of custom, where he says, we are able to trace in the colonial period how, for example, male elders were able to press for and establish as customary law a form of marriage which was clearly not that practiced by most people in pre-colonial or early colonial times and which was indeed resisted by many. Their assertion of control over women and over family property was supported by colonial administrators as it accorded with the administrator's own prescriptions for African society. As one traces the story of these developments, it becomes plain that customary law is to be treated as a matter of politics and not of culture. So one source, and a highly controversial source, 
is what the men decided was custom. And as Chanok notes, what men decided as custom tended to coincide with their desire to control female bodies and their desire to control property. And that too coincided with what colonial administrators wanted to see because their perception of African society was as patriarchal, perhaps in a sense, backward societies. And it is this which was written into law and which became the benchmark for customary law. And so this was then what became official customary law. And it is this that was codified in institutions or instruments like the Natal Code. And it is this that was applied by many of these uh, institutions like the native appeal courts. But when the Constitution speaks of customary law in the three sections that I have identified, is it also asking us to follow the decisions of the native appeal court, the decisions uh, reflected in the code, or the patriarchal practices that we have inherited and they have been imposed on us from the top rather than from below? This is a difficult question. I want to suggest. John Hunt has suggested that law can be separated from custom by asking the question whether or not those who observe custom do it because of a sense of obligation or because of a sense of a fear of punishment. So the point at which custom was translated into law was when there were repercussions for non-compliance. But prior to that, when it was still custom, there was no repercussion for non-compliance. There was maybe cultural pressure, maybe social pressure, but no legal pressure. And so what made customary law, what made custom customary law was a Western Eurocentric notion that there is a punishment for non-compliance with custom. That is an issue we have to grapple with. How do we distinguish between those norms and values that are purely custom from those norms and values that also have a legal bite? And yes, in certain contexts like marriage, like contract, like delict, We're talking customary contract and customary delict, people will be surprised to hear that these things exist. They do exist. There might be a sense of obligation, but not the same sense of obligation that one would comply in fear of criminal sanctions, but a sense of obligation out of a fear of a moral or societal rejection. So the second point is to identify specifically those areas of customary law that require compliance and those areas that are distinguishable because they are merely custom and therefore doing or not doing is voluntary. There is a third problem, of course. The problem is how does one identify what is traditional customarily observed in order to identify what the custom is. I have already identified the critique that we can no longer resort to old methods of identifying custom. We have to identify new methods. What may that look like? And this I'm about to sit down. I want to identify one case that might help us to resolve this and to look at the approach followed by the uh, Constitutional Court. Uh, it's a Mayelane case determining the content of living customary law. Most of you may have seen or heard about that case, um, but it is a case that was intended to identify whether or not as a matter of custom when a man wanted to marry a second or third wife, they needed the consent of the first wife. 
Remember that case? So much turned on the approach that was followed by the court in which it refused to answer the question unless further evidence was collected. And where was the further evidence collected? That further evidence was collected from the community itself. And within the community, there were disagreement about, disagreements about what the content of the Tsonga customary law is. Some people argued that consent is always necessary, and when it is not given, the subsequent marriage is invalid. Other people argued that consent should be sought, but the mere fact that it is withheld would not invalidate the subsequent marriage. Other people argued that there is no such a requirement at all. There was also evidence from traditional leaders and traditional leaders also disagreed about the content of the customary rule. There was also evidence from experts, historians, people like Professor Bunzaya, Dr. Mthaba. Dr. Mthaba's evidence, for instance, was of the view that if the first wife did not consent, the families would become involved to resolve the matter. So, even where the method has been agreed, a lot of scope still remains for the resolution of the disputes arising as to the content of the rule. And here is the role of the Constitution. And this is where the values underpinning the Constitution become important. Sometimes the rule of custom will be clear because there will be consensus within the community about what the content of customary law is. Sometimes the rule will be less clear, such as the case that I have identified. But an interpretation of that rule would then be guided, which is why Section 39.2 is important, by Section 9 of the Constitution that requires the courts to follow an approach that would be more consistent with the underlying values of the Constitution, equality being one of them. And in those cases, it seems clear that if you are asking the question whether or not a man is entitled to marry a second and a third wife without the consent of the first wife, and to try to find which approach would be consistent with the Constitution, it seems obvious that an approach that prioritizes the consent of the wife existing in a marriage would be deemed to be more consistent with the Constitution. The same the uh, theoretical framework can go in different directions. Take, for instance, the case whether or not Ingonyama Trust in KwaZulu Natal is entitled to impose taxes in the form of rentals on the community, and whether it is entitled to eject members of the community that refuse to pay those rentals and how that relationship between Ingonyama Trust that concentrates power at the top is to be interpreted through the lens of the Constitution. A method that is truly informed by the customary norms, living customary law, not past customary law or official customary law, would then require the court to give meaning to the needs and desires and aspirations of the marginalized people and perhaps strike down a rule that gives Ingonyama Trust indiscriminate power to impose uh, or extract rentals from the community, which is what recently happened in the case of uh, KSAC versus uh, Ingonyama Trust. The case is currently pending before the Supreme Court of Appeal. Similarly, customary law may also be used to acquire rights that don't exist, right? that don't exist or not recognized in law. Take, for instance, the case of Kongose, right, versus the Minister of Environmental Affairs, in which Mr. Kongose was charged for illegally fishing. And his defense was that he had not been illegally fishing. He had simply been practicing what customarily for decades, if not centuries, had been practiced by the people of Dwesakwebe. 
and that their method of fishing, which was distinct from the commercial method of fishing, in fact, was much more attuned to the environmental sustainability fishing practices. And the court which acquitted him at the Supreme Court of Appeal recognized the power of the argument of resorting to custom to protect access to existing resources. Take another case, Richtersfeld and Alexco, in which access to minerals may also be identified as lying primarily in indigenous claims. I want to end by suggesting then back to the two theoretical approaches. One is method is important as a mechanism of creating legitimacy. Content is a controversial topic and it can move in different directions. But content always takes us back to method, which means that a proper study of customary law must always focus on its methodological approaches, because that is what ultimately gives it legitimacy. Thank you. Very, very <laughs> powerful lecture indeed. Uh, we now have a panel discussion, and there are three people on our panel. But in the interests of time, we're going to ask you please to speak for less than your allocated time. Uh, and we uh, beg your forgiveness. Uh, but firstly, it would be uh, Professor Norma Langa Makize, who my colleague will introduce, uh, Mr. Wangaletu Simayile and Mr. Shatakani Smeller, if the three of you could please come up, and I will hand over to Gama to introduce. Well, uh, yeah, well, Prof. Mkise needs no introduction. She's uh, very well known. She is the director of school at the School of Governmental and Social Sciences in the humanities. We have a lot of pride in her and her leadership uh, as the university and she's written a lot, um, uh, children's books included among some of the things that are wonderful that she's done. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Thank Professor you. Nomalanga Mkise. And then if we could have on the stage, please as well, Mr. Wongoletu Simayani, come and sit over here, please. He is a former chairperson. Yeah, I'm gonna introduce them first and then I'm gonna let you all go. Uh, a former chairperson of the Nelson Mandela University student chapter of the Black Lawyers Association and the current, I'm told, the current secretary general of the national executive of the BLA student chapter. He's also a postgraduate associate in the faculty of law and an LLM student. And then Mr. Shatakani Smeller is a third year LLB student. He's a bright young star, top law student in 2022 the treasurer, I believe, of the Law Students Association, and an avid strategist, because I believe he's a champion chess player. Mr. Smeller. Is it working now? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Reverend, Prof. Advocate. Now, I don't know if you're going to finish. I'm going to finish the university. I'm No, Prof. Sayonkeland. Um, no, thank you, colleagues. Um, I think uh, ours is to reflect, so we don't have to rebut or critique or even say anything remotely related, <laughs> thank goodness. Um, and uh, I think that uh, what, in fact, my first reflection, uh, Prof. Pityana, is we're going to uh, need uh, a, a, a student um, who is going to write on the rule and reign of Minza. Yeah? Hmm. yeah. To think Uguti in our uh, his, uh, our corpus of South African history, Kumkaniza is a kind of a mention here and a mention there, mm -hmm. and a side note here and a villain here and a victim there. It's it's actually very very uh, uh, striking when I thought about the, the the amount of work that uh, 
prior writers, of course, I have devoted to describing mm. the reign of Ukumgani Hinza mm. in different literary forms mm. and the significance of Hinza's reign and his warrior leadership at that. Mm. So we have here uh, a sort of, uh, in biblical terms, I mean, we, I'm not sure, a combination of a soul, a combination of a soul at David, you know, you've got like a, a, a leader. I, I mean, I, 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 <laughs> Sunday school, Jesus. <laughs> Did I pass that one? Um, but you understand what I'm saying. And I don't know if the people in the room understand the significance of what I'm saying. I'm mm. saying one of the most significant leaders of the Eastern Cape who was assassinated uh, uh, by the British uh, in, in cold blood. Very little has been written about his, his reign in the mainstream uh, uh, historiography. So that's not that's not a that's not a, a light thing. Many of our our uh, sort of the leaders of the times of our independence. I can't say Hinza was was pre-colonial per se, but those leaders have not been written about. So how and so the rule and reign of Ukumkan Hinza. <laughs> I'm picking on you now. Um, with that in mind, I think what the the conversation has been about is. Uh, Basically, how does the law transition from being an unjust to becoming a just instrument of society? Mm -hmm. This is the question between Ijala Lamawele and then the descendant of that system, which is Nelson Mandela fighting his system, mm -hmm. uh, fighting a system. And there's questions of the legitimation of law. How does one legitimate law in a society that has gone from being unjust and attempting to be just? And I will tell you something, and I want both of you to think about it. This is my reflection, really. This is what I said to Albie Sachs that day, <laughs> Professor Odendal, oh, that day, <laughs> at your book launch uh, in, at Constitution Hill. I said to Albie Sachs, um, Albie, the Constitution in this country only works because we have to keep the white economy and white contracts alive. Mm. That if you look at what happens actually where we see an absence of economy and an absence of a, 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 what one should just call the contract system that sustains the white economy, we're seeing a breakdown of serious, uh, a serious breakdown of law and order. Uh, Professor Advocate, I'm arguing that in fact in this country if we look deeply, what's guaranteeing the constitution is the fear of economic collapse. So in fact, what's guaranteeing the uh, rights of Umakulu, what's enabling us to um, interpret customary law, the one thing that black and white South Africans can agree on is that we need this thing so that the economy and the contract system does not collapse. And I just argue this because look everywhere where we are in charge as black people, as Africans, and I use Mtata as the example of a breakdown in an understanding of what is law and order within society. Not because there was no law and order, <laughs> not because black people don't know the law, but because when you are transitioning from an unjust to a just system, there is a vacuum which opens and there's no consensus about what should make the law work. The one thing that we can agree on though is we cannot let the economy collapse. But that does not mean that we agree that Umakulu requires protection. In fact, she does not get protection. So I wanted us to think about that and that transition that opens up. And here, of course, I'm thinking of Russia. I'm thinking of the, the I'm thinking of Russia in its transition. I'm mm -hmm. thinking of, in, of, of Eastern Europe mm -hmm. in its transitions and the collapse of moral norms mm -hmm. and therefore the ineffectiveness of law. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, audible now? Yeah, you're fine. Um, thank you, Prof. Uh, Prof. Pitian and Prof. Mugato for the, for the lecture and for your response. Um, when, when, you know, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> yes. I, for my assignment, because I work with the, at the law faculty, for my assignment, I, I teach customary law. Mm -hmm. So, um, wonderful. And your discussion on Italalama Wele was, was quite moving for me because I, I even 
while well, I was sitting there, went through the textbook a few times, and I thought it doesn't feature anywhere. You know, we have here is a a way of Africans of a way of Africans for dispute resolution, but it doesn't feature anywhere when we discuss um, customary law. So that is uh, perhaps an indictment on somebody. Um, that is something that must, that's something that must be resolved. Um, then now, Mandela is a black man in a white man's court. We are in 2023 now, uh, almost 30 years of the Constitution, almost 30 years of democracy. <coughs> but has that changed? Uh, black men and women who go to court, are they in a white man's court still? And I think when I, when I, some of the things I do when I read judgments, especially landmark judgments, I, lo I look at the end where it, it shows the, the, um, the representatives, the, the lawyers, and I, and I always check who, who, are the, uh, who are the firms, first of all, that are dealing with the case, and who are the advocates that have been briefed. And you check in most cases, particularly the, the, the landmark judgments, the ones that shape our jurisprudence and to an extent our society, mm -hmm. it's white lawyers. And so we are still black men in a white man's court. After so many years of a transformative constitution, of a, of, of a democracy. And so it's, it's inspiring and refreshing to have uh, people like Uchola. Um, I say Chola because I'm in Uchola. <laughs> <laughs> um, as uh, representing or the change um, that must take place. Of course, there has been some, some strides. You know, we have more black judges now than we have ever had in the past. More women judges now than we've ever had in the past. So that's that's a step forward. But of course, we still need to do more work. And I say this as a prospective um, lawyer. You know, we, we think, my friends and I, many times and discuss extensively about whether we should even leave where we are now. And uh, maybe we should consider academia because it's so hard to make it as a black man in the legal profession because it's still um, white. Uh, that is something that must be changed. Um, for example, look, maybe we go in and, and bring no. it to the university now and how it has a responsibility because the university has a role in academia. And I, I, I spoke about Nijala Lama well. How can that be incorporated in the curriculum? When the university goes to court, for example, who, who represents the university in court? Who are the people that the university briefs? So that also translates to, are we still uh, black people in a white man's court? So there's a whole um, spectrum and range of spectrum of things and they're intertwined. And the, the solution is the same, transformation. Um, I think that's it from me, thank you. Hi everyone. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just be brief. Um, firstly, I would like to thank the two speakers today, not just for this session, but also for the master class in the morning. Um, the sessions were truly powerful and insightful and I've learned so much in one day. So we really, really appreciate it. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll just be brief. Um, my main takeaway is that as emerging scholars, particularly in this legal field of ours, it's important that we aspire to be critical thinkers as opposed to just regurgitating information. In that way, our learning institutions at large, they will become intellectual hubs as opposed to plagiarism hubs. So, <laughs> so thank you so much, uh, it's truly an honor. The round of applause. It's really amazing to um, listen to 
this multi-generational uh, or intergenerational conversation, um, in terms of which we're having really great presentations from these uh, distinguished scholars, and we are now uh, going to be coming to you, and we hope you've been all ears throughout uh, the session. And yeah, in the interest of unmediated conversation and time, we're gonna go straight to yourselves. Are there any people who would like to contribute? We have uh, one person. Uh, uh, let me take, let me note a few hands. You, ma'am, a third one, right at the back. Uh, for now, let me take one, two, three. Um, once he's done, we'll take another three and then have them respond. Uh, I started, we started somewhere here. Oh, oh, here, here's Prof. Oh, okay, I, th I thought you had raised your hand to speak, actually. Okay, you may proceed, now you have the mic. Um, good evening, everyone, I hope I'm audible. Um, just to um, build up on what um, Prof was saying, and I'll just draw from something I heard. I used to like reading um, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, for those who may know her, and she writes a lot on literature. So the one thing that she said, and I've said this, I think, before, whereby she does explain um, we have the law, right? But the role of literature is to tell the stories that, you know, that would bring about the law, right? And sometimes, I'm just wondering, um, the law that was brought up, which is quote-unquote from the other countries, whereby now we are a constitutional state and we have equality and we have democracy, which allows us to function as um, one integrated country, but does that actually represent and tell about our culture and the laws that we had as African people? I don't know if that necessarily makes sense. And also, um, just to like add on to that. Um, okay. we, we do have time for one comment or question per person. Sorry about that. Uh, the Yes, sir, at the back. Hello. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Lavela Mkilana, and I'm going to go to the next one. i the um, firstly, I'd like to appreciate um, the organizers, the university, for making us very fortunate, Namhlanje, to have two events in one day. And I'd also like to, in particular, send a heartfelt gratitude to Baujola, uh, for the work that he has been doing. Um, in the journey of Ibuyambo, Yaban Bakut. Um, I can only hold back tears if I start to imagine in the 1800s and before what our ancestors have went through and the so-called civilization process that took place thereof. And go start. Yes, coming to the question, I'll also like to appreciate about Ramin Baupijana. Ukonum uh, in the program that yes. was going to do it. Sorry. Okay, okay. Question, I'll, I'll get to the question. Yeah. My question intersects with the input Kabaupijana on the issue of Ichalalamawel. I have a particular Ichalalamawel as a senior engineer in the private sector. I happen to be part of the Employment Equity Forum. Call it that, we, we're running out of time. Yes, Can yes, you go yes, straight yes. to the question, okay. please? The issue is this, um, there's been so much resistance for transformation. And um, I'm of the view, as part of an ongoing process, to sort of design um, a training module for everyone within the organization. And I'd like to ask about Nukai Tobi, where can I begin? Because I believe... Thank um, you. Thank you. We yeah. got it. The transformation can I please challenges. finish off? Uh, no, no, sir. Uh, you, you've taken, I think, about two minutes. Can we have the last speaker, okay. please? Go, Sinda Gwetu. We met all the so we met up. Thank you, Prof. Uh, I'm SD, you know? 
uh, admitted attorney who's doing a master's year. I was admitted in 2001. Uh, the, the context of the presentation, I think it's not good enough. I don't want to say it's substandard because it speaks about Africans. There's a judgment that a graduate from Botswana, from Lesotho, from Zimbabwe, who graduated here, is unable to be employed on the basis of the Constitutional Court judgment. So to link the cultures, to link the law, I think uh, because this question is directed uh, to advocate and uh, white uh, to give us direction. What must we do with these graduates who come from, who are Africans, who come from African countries, who are allowed to study here when they graduated, they are unable to practice law. That's a question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's all we had time for this evening. Let's give them a round of applause. We are going to have, oh, oh, we're going to have them answer, and then uh, 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 Prof will introduce the last speaker. Um, if they if they want to answer where they sit, that's also fine. Um, yeah. So I, I, I suppose I could start. Um, so I, I think I'll leave the. The, the topics that have to do with the discussion to Professor Pichana. He is the main speaker after all. I, I'm just a, a, an appendage. Uh, but there are sort of two questions I just wanted to deal with, uh, which are outside of the topic. The, the, the one seems to be this sort of underlying issue, and I was asked this question in the morning as well about, you know, is there a future for black law students, and what does that future look like, you know? My view about it is that there is a bright future for, for black law students. There is so much that we need to change in our legal system. It is almost an impossible job, and there are very few of us. Um, and the reason I say this is because if you look at sort of quote-unquote advanced societies, America, England, at the population of the lawyers compared to the population of the society as a whole, we are still far to matching those uh, societies. The problems are different problems that we have about access to work for, 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 for black lawyers. The problems we have are that black lawyers, well, all of us as lawyers tend to concentrate in the same areas of law, the road accident fund claims, and that kind of thing. And yet, we have a big inequality problem in South Africa. We are the most unequal country in the world. We have to be litigating on problems of inequality. We have big problems of access to resources, access to banking services, uh, access to insurance services, access to pension services. Most of that is not actually litigated, and if you look at who's going to litigate us, look at the, those topics are primarily black lawyers because they come from families or come from backgrounds in which there is a need to litigate those. I'll take one example. Last week, I spent three days in the Pretoria High Court on litigating over load shedding. Now, we've had load shedding for 10 years, right? And we have not litigated it. And in fact, if you thought creatively about what the sort of legal possibilities are on the issue of load shedding, and we had nine advocates that were involved in the case just for the applicants alone. And the respondents also had another you know, 20 advocates on their side, and I can't even remember the number of uh, uh, attorneys that were involved. And there is a possibility you can institute a class action over all the damages that have been sustained by businesses because of the problem of load shedding. So most of the problems are thinking creatively about what to do with the Bill of Rights. Because the Bill of Rights is a document that is just pregnant with a thousand possibilities. So the real issue is what do we do with it? So I think that's the one issue. But I was saying uh, with the prof here that perhaps we should have another conversation on another occasion with the black law students of this university about what the future holds for them and why, despite everything, I am very optimistic about the possibility of uh, the black legal landscape in South Africa. The, the, 
And then the second issue is around, you know, this constitutional, I, I don't agree with the way the constitutional court interpreted the law, but the solution is very simple. The parliament must change the law so as to make it explicit or clear that people from Botswana, uh, Lesotho, Swaziland can practice law in South Africa because that case was about interpreting uh, certain provisions of a statute, uh, testing them against the constitution. But you can have different provisions of a statute. I, I tried to argue a case in Zimbabwe, I was kicked out by the soldiers, <laughs> right? No, I mean, it happened five years ago. We, we were kicked out by the soldiers and they took us from the courtroom to uh, the airport, you know? So I can't agree with, you know, Zimbabwean lawyers must be treated the same way in South Africa. I mean, that's all very, very regressive. It's a reflection of an apartheid era mentality, which created these artificial borders coming all the way from 1885. So if we can have a way in which we can integrate the Southern African region as a start, so that I can appear here, you know, South African lawyers can appear, I mean, I was in Lesotho four weeks ago. You know, we can appear in Lesotho, we can appear in Swaziland, we can appear in Namibia and elsewhere. But the lawyers from those countries can't appear here. I mean, the whole thing is upset, you know. But you can put pressure on parliament to change the law so that we have the same sort of system. And my own belief is that if you open up the SADC region, it's in fact South African lawyers that would benefit the most. So it makes no sense from a commercial point of view, from a political point of view, and just, it's like just bad politics, you know, it, that the policy that's followed by the South African government. And it's feeding into this problem of xenophobia. So it's completely bad policy that we should be changing. You ask what can be done? Well, why don't I invite you to write a letter to parliament and ask them to change the law? for that uh, advocate, uh, Guy Toby, really two points, um, some of it underlying uh, rather than explicit. <clears throat> I think fundamentally, uh, uh, if this society doesn't um, get transformed through the committed uh, activity of lawyers and the manner in which we do law, then it will be very, very difficult for society to be transformed and for people to be freed. So there is a role in societies like ours of intense inequality that it should be possible to get selfless lawyers who seek to transform the structures of society and the way in which society works uh, so that ultimately we can have a system of justice in a very true sense. I had a sense uh, <clears throat> uh, from what you were saying that at the end of the day, uh, it's not really just about whether you've got black or white, although that's not without significance. But the important thing is that um, the sense of alienation about the courts and the courts we have is more than uh, just the color we have, is the, is the process of law that is taking place and the manner in which just decisions are found. Um, it, it does seem to be the case in South Africa, at least that's the common idea, that the more money you have, the more likely you're going to get out of uh, the, the system, the more connected you are with the elite of our country in politics or business, the more likely it is that you can drag on cases that you may never go to court ultimately. So there is an inherent uh, system of inequality that is sensed or felt by many of our people. And part of, part of the struggle towards a more equal uh, a society has to do, I think, with with how we do law, and this is this is the importance of the of the subject we have today. How do we do law? Who does it include? Who does it exclude? Um, because at the end of the day, you may be a black judge, but 
as a black judge, you are capable of doing law in a manner that is alienating because that's what you are trained, that's how you are trained, that's what you know, that's what you apply. And, and, and that's, that really is what we, we need to struggle uh, uh, about. In other words, we look beyond the minutiae of, of how uh, we live our society, but how do we construct, continuously construct a more just society? Um, from the places where we are, uh, in, the, in the whatever we are in, it is possible for us to strive towards a more just dispensation for everybody. Let me stop there. Thank you very much to, to both of you. And uh, talking about uh, load shedding, I think it was Advocate Tembeka who very aptly said last week that load shedding is not an act of God. <laughs> he did indeed, so it isn't. In any event, it, it brings us to the end of and I now call on the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Law, Dr. Lynn Biggs, to close um, with some closing remarks and um, a word of farewell. Thank you very much. Over to you, Lynn. Good afternoon to all of you. Um, also, in the interest of time, uh, but uh, especially thank you to the VC that was here. She had to leave a little earlier. To the DVCs that are present or um, attending online. To uh, the members of senior management that I can see here as well, other executive deans, friends, family, special guests that have arrived, and of course, a special greeting to our Prof Barney and Prof Tembeka. Um, and very special uh, thank you to our students that are in attendance this afternoon, the students from the Faculty of Law and students from the Faculty of Humanities. So a few weeks ago, I attended a meeting and I happened to sit next to my dear friend and colleague, Prof Pam Maseko. And the, for the duration of the meeting, we were whispering to each other about how we can talk about transdisciplinary engagements and faculty collaboration in our quest as a part of the Vision 2030 strategy of Nelson Mandela University to revitalize and reimagine the humanities and to awaken African scholarship and systems of thought. Then I also was thinking about and, and want to bring to your attention that the core positioning messages that underpin the Vision 2030 strategy is to provide transformative lifelong learning experiences that advance agency, sorry, sorry, lifelong learning experiences that liberate human potential and also to engage with all publics in equalizing partnerships that advance agency and promote the co-creation of African purposed solutions. And this is in our commitment to change the world through life-changing, student-centric educational opportunities, innovative research, and transformative engagement that contribute to a better world. Well, Prof Barney and Prof Tembeka, um, how fitting were your discussions today of these core messages and our quest to revitalize the humanities through a student-centric approach? You have exposed our students to vibrant, stimulating, and thought-provoking educational experiences today. We are humbled and truly blessed to have witnessed and engaged with your insightful storytelling of the rich and diverse legal indigenous heritage as we embody African-rooted knowledge generation. We are most grateful to you for sharing your learnings and experiences of African indigenous jurisprudence with us, and especially with our students this morning. A special thank you, um, Prof, for this morning's session, um, the masterclass. Unfortunately, I couldn't attend. I had another faculty engagement. Um, with our students this morning, the feedback was that they were blown away and, and most, most grateful. The topic being history in law and law in history allowed our students to contextualize the value of an historical archive and the historicizing disciplines such as the law. I'd also like to acknowledge our students from the Black Lawyers um, Association, student chapter, and the Law Students Society 
who together with the students from the Faculty of Humanities assisted our master's students from the Faculty of Law to facilitate um, the discussion and engagement with you this morning. And then of course, lastly, to the organizers and everybody behind the scenes, um, a huge thank you to all of you for the finer details that make today such a successful day. Thank you to Olwam and his team. And then lastly, I'd like to obviously call upon um, our panel members, uh, Wanga and uh, Shatakane, if you could come forward and just present gifts to our, our, spe our guest speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so everybody, that means we are done for today. Thank you very much to all of you for being here. And uh, we look forward to another occasion. So thank you. Over and out. Bye. <laughs>